morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here. It's also nice to not have to think of what I have to say to the cheering and clapping. So I'm thankful for that today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer before we look at it. Our Father in heaven, God, we thank you for our time together, for the songs that we sang. And as we look at your word, Lord, we pray that you would be with us, that your Holy Spirit would teach us from your word. And we ask that you would teach us wonders of your law, help us to grow in our trust for you. So we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. So I'll open with a question. So when is someone foolish? When was the time that you thought of yourself as foolish? You look back at an experience and you might say, oh, I was such a fool this time. And you might wonder at, at our passage today, why does Paul call the Galatians foolish? Doesn't he know what Jesus said? Jesus said, don't call your brother or sister a fool. And you'll see that right away in our passage, that Paul speaks very bluntly to these Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? So that's verse 1. And then in verse 3, are you so foolish? So it's rare to see Paul speak like this. And now, and you notice that I've jumped to Galatians 3. So I've jumped over Galatians 1 and 2. But there's lots to be said about what's written in, in those chapters. So I'll summarize a few key points uh, from chapters 1 and 2 because I think it's helpful background knowledge for what we're going to be getting into today. So in those two chapters, there is an emphasis on Paul's credentials. So Paul emphasizes that his authority, it ultimately comes from God. And that's why he retells the story of his conversion and also his acceptance by the apostles. Paul also makes it very clear that there is only one gospel. There is no other gospel. But it also presents a problem uh, that's happening in the churches of, of Galatia. So you'll notice that it's um, plural in the greeting, so to the churches of Galatia, not the church of Galatia. Galatia was a large region uh, filled with many churches, so there wasn't just one, and there are people who have snuck in. So chapter 2, verse 4, yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. So these people are the Judaizers, people who insisted on following the law, the law of Moses, and circumcision. So physical circumcision, uh, let me remind you, it was a mark of the covenant in the Old Testament. So it was a physical mark that showed that you belonged to the people of God uh, in the Old Testament. It was a sign that you belonged to the covenant, the promise. And these Judaizers were also the ones who were troubling the churches of Galatia. And they wanted to twist the gospel of Jesus Christ. So chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Not that there is another one, like another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So these troublemakers, they likely made claims against Paul's apostleship. They didn't think that he was a legitimate apostle. So Paul has to make a defense, both of himself and also of the gospel that he preaches. But now in chapter 3, Paul has to deal with some of the consequences of what these Judaizers were teaching. So hopefully, as we look at this passage, uh, you aren't thinking in the back of your minds, does he think we are foolish? Is that why I chose this passage? No, certainly not. But I believe Galatians 3, as God's word, it is always relevant, and that there's nothing new under the sun. So human nature largely is unchanged from the beginning of history until now. And some of the pitfalls that the Galatians fell into are still common today. And we can learn from the direction that Paul gives. So the main point for my message today is to live by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works or works of the law. So live by faith in Jesus Christ and not by works or works of the law. So the passage can be broken down into the following. So the spirit is received by faith from verses 1 to 6. Then there's the example of Abraham's, uh, Abraham's faith, verses 6 to 9. And then trust in Christ and not the law from verses 10 to 14. So Paul first deals with the main issue that the Judaizers uh, brought up, mainly the idea of how you continue in salvation. Then he gives proof or evidence for his reasoning from the example of Abraham. And then 
sort of the natural results. So if you trust in Allah, if you hear by faith, what is the natural result? So the first section, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So Paul here, he's not calling the Galatians foolish because of their intellectual abilities. He doesn't think that they're literally dumb, but he's calling them foolish because, because of how they apply what they know. So they have heard the gospel already. They have personally experienced the effects of the crucifixion of Christ. And what I mean by that is that the Galatians are Christians already. They've trusted in Jesus already. They should know that there is no other gospel. But they have been bewitched. They're hypnotized. They're unable to see what is right before them. So in the ancient world, magic was attractive to the people of the time. Magic promised people control over their own lives. And especially in the ancient world, the world was one that was filled with many things beyond their control. So there were many uncertainties. And Paul is drawing a connection here between how magic bewitches people and how the Galatians were bewitched. So the Galatians were fascinated by what the Judaizers were teaching, which was circumcision and following the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. And in that sense, those are works. Works gave them a sense of control over their lives. And this fascination, it blinded them to the obvious. And here it's the importance of the cross of Christ. So likewise, today, there are many things that distract us from the cross of Christ. One of the issues that comes up in Galatians is not how you become a Christian, but how you stay a Christian. And the answer to both these questions is the same. It is all by God's grace. You receive the spirit by faith when you become a Christian, and you're kept by that same spirit. But as I said, in the world we live in, there are many distractions. You probably don't follow the law of Moses, but there are other works that you might trust in. Social media and the culture around you, they are constantly bombarding you with issues that you need to have an opinion on. So things that aren't important are suddenly made into an important issue. So it's almost like, yes, you are a Christian if you believe the gospel, but, but you must also follow these things. You must participate in this movement or you must give your voice for this issue if you are a Christian. So some of these things, they might be Christian, some of them might not be. Some of, the, some of these things are good things, others not so much, but they all distract from the importance of the cross. And when these things are made mandatory, so in addition to the gospel, you must also believe this if you're a Christian, it takes away from the gospel. Turning away from sin and living by faith in Jesus and believing in Jesus' death and resurrection that's the most important part of the gospel. And I'll come back to more to this in application. So verse three, Paul continues. Are you so foolish? Paul, Paul is speaking strongly to, to shock the Galatians almost back to reality. So it's like in the movies where if you see someone who's like in a daze, someone has to hit them and say, hey, wake up, snap out of it. Paul is doing something similar here. He wants the Galatians to wake up from their, bewi from their bewitchment. He reminds them of the truth. Are you so foolish? Don't you already know this as Christians? He asked them in verse two, did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? And now he asks, having begun by the spirits, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness. So the answer is clear. It is not by works of the law, but by hearing with faith. So when you become a Christian, it's not because of anything that you did to earn God's love. You were certainly not good enough on your own character to deserve salvation from God. You didn't do anything that made you worthy to be saved. You didn't decide and say, yes, at this very moment or three years from now, 10 years or at this certain time, I will be saved. 
but instead, you understood that God already did the work. Jesus already died on the cross for all of your sins. Once and for all, that sacrifice. For every sin that you did in the past, every sin that you'll commit today, and every sin that you will ever do. And then God made it clear to you that you needed to turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Only the blood of Christ could cover your sins. And as you read through the Gospels, that's a cry that you see. People are crying out, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. You heard the gospel message, and the response was not a work or action that you could do, but faith, simply to believe. And faith's response is a cry to God that he would have mercy on you and save you from your sin, because Jesus paid it all on the cross already, and because nothing else can. Nothing else can save you. As we sang earlier, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And your response to the gospel message was not to do better or to do more good, but you simply believed that it was true, that the gospel message was true. You can admit, I am a sinner, but Jesus died for me. I am a sinner, but Jesus died for me. And it's a personal admission, not a general one. Yes, Jesus died for the sins of the world, but Jesus died for my sins. And so the way that you receive salvation is the same way that you continue in salvation. So the Galatians here seem to think that you could add something to what God had already done. So God saves you and God keeps you. That's the truth. But instead of relying entirely upon the spirit, the Galatians were attracted to being perfected by the flesh. So what that means is that they were going back to the old ways, to the Mosaic covenant, trusting in circumcision and the works of the law, but ultimately those things are, are useless. They're useless because they cannot save you. The mark of the covenant and the obedience to the Mosaic law, they cannot save you, they cannot cover your sin. And the example of Abraham and the following will show why. So you might ask, why does Paul reference Abraham all of a sudden? How does Abraham fit here? And if you know your Old Testament, you'll know that Abraham came before Moses. So Abraham was not remembered as one of the greats in Israel's history simply because he received circumcision. But instead, Abraham was remembered because of his faith, because he believed God. So when God called Abraham to move to a foreign land, Abraham obeyed. God made a covenant, a promise with Abraham to bless him and to make a great nation of him. And he would do this from Abraham's old offspring despite his own age. And Abraham simply believed that God would do it. God would do the impossible for Abraham. So in light of the contrast between the works of the law and hearing by faith, Abraham is an example of hearing by faith. God made a covenant with Abraham, and then the mark of cir circumcision comes after. So first, Abraham believed, then there's circumcision, the proof or the mark of that promise. The same is true also of Israel. So you'll remember from the history, God delivers Israel from slavery out of Egypt. He saves them first, and then later they receive the law. The same is true in James. First you have faith, then works will naturally proceed. As Christians too, first you're saved, then you're commanded to be obedient. So the Judaizers, uh, they likely thought of Abraham as their, their father, but Paul makes it clear that the sons of Abraham are those who are of faith. So yes, there are physical descendants of Abraham, but there are also spiritual descendants. When God said that he would make Abraham's offspring as, as numerous as the stars above, as many as the stars of the heavens, he wasn't referring to just a physical bloodline that could be numbered, but to a spiritual one. In the Galatians here, evidently they're not Jews, uh, but Paul makes it clear that the scriptures foreshadowed this, that salvation was meant to come to all of the nations, not only to the Jews. So that's true today, isn't it? There are Christians, there are God's people from many nations, from many languages, from many, many tribes. And the final picture in Revelation is from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. But if you look at the passage, you'll see that it says God would justify the Gentiles, Gentiles meaning non-Jews, by faith. 
And justification has the meaning of being declared righteous. So to use an example, um, I think older siblings, you'll know the opposite feeling um, of this. But older siblings, if you know, your younger sibling might do something that gets you in trouble. But for, but for some reason, you're the one who gets in trouble. Your younger sibling who did it, they get off free. Your parents, they look at them, look as if they did nothing wrong. Your younger siblings are justified in a sense. They're free to go. But you, somehow it's your fault. So that's a bit of like what Christ experienced, where Christ suffered for the sins of the world, uh, but not for his own sins, because he didn't have any sins. But there's the idea of justification. You are, you've done nothing wrong. So God would count the Gentiles as righteous if they had faith. If they have faith, they will, they will be blessed. They will, they will be blessed like how Abraham was blessed. And by faith, Abraham was in a covenant relationship with God. He walked with God. But let me clarify one thing. Although Abraham believed, he was not justified simply because he had faith specifically. So believing by itself, that, that's not good enough. It's like saying, I believe God exists, but that will not justify anyone. So in James, it says that the demons believe that God exists, and unlike mankind, they also tremble out of fear because of that truth. But Abraham was justified because of the object of his faith, what he believed in. And what did Abraham believe? He believed that God would fulfill his promise to him. And in the same way as Christians, Christians are justified because of the object of our faith, Jesus Christ. You might believe that Jesus, that Jesus is a good teacher, but that will not justify you. You need to believe that Jesus did what God said he would do, and that is to redeem mankind from the curse of sin, which he accomplished by his perfect life and by his death on the cross. And faith means to trust in something. So if you trust in Jesus' perfect life and death for the penalty of your sin, you trust that your sin is paid for in full. There's nothing more to pay. If you, if you trust God at his word, then you will obey God as a way to honor him. So you believe what he says is good and it's right. To use a human example, and hopefully it's a appropriate example since many of you play softball, um, if you trust your teammates when they call mine to make a catch, you don't push them out of the way to make the catch. If you don't trust them, you might push them out of the way to make the catch so that you can do it yourself. So you dishonor their actions when you don't trust them. And in the same way, if you don't trust God, you will do things your way. You will push aside God's commandments and say, I'll trust on my own understanding and on my own wisdom instead of God's wisdom. But God is certainly trustworthy. He has never failed to keep a promise. And he is faithful to everything that he has said. So you honor God by following his commandments if you trust in him. His words, they carry weight in your life, in the things you do, the things you say, what you think. And what I mean by carrying weight is what he says has an impact on your life. It's almost like if you, if you get a haircut and then maybe your parents tell you, you know, your, your haircut looks good, but you sort of think, well, they have to say it looks good. So then you go to your friend that you trust and then you ask them for their opinion. Does my haircut actually look good? And then you, you sort of trust their opinion. So their words carry weights in your life. In the same way, God's words should carry weight in your life. So in the final section, Paul explains why you should not trust in the law. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. So if you want to trust in the law, then you have to keep all of it perfectly. For the Galatians, if they accepted circumcision, then they would also have to follow the rest of the law, all of it. But it is clear, verse 11, it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. And God sees everything that is done, and the Bible is clear that there is no one good, not even one. So if you want to trust in the law and be counted righteous, to be blameless, to be justified, 
then you have to keep all of the law and all of it perfectly. So consider even the command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All means every part, with everything. So not just when it's easy or when it's convenient, but your entire life and with all your strength, you are to love the Lord your God with everything. And it's an impossible task. That's only one of the laws. There's loving people. Love your neighbor as yourself. And isn't it so hard to love people? Some people are just so unlovable. There are limits to your love, isn't there? And there's many more, many more laws that I could go into. But the main point is, none of us could do it perfectly. And God knows all the ways that you fall short of, your, of his law. God knows the ways, all the ways that you break his law. And when God examines you and sees all that you've done, you could not say, I am righteous or I am blameless. If you want to trust in the law, you have to be perfect. Now, maybe you're thinking, isn't it a bit unreasonable for God to expect perfection? It's like, as someone was telling me this week, they were venting really, my teacher gave me a zero because of one little mistake. It's unfair, isn't it? And in a way, that's what happens when you trust the law. If you fail to keep one part of the law, then you break all of it. The law is all connected. It's a whole. And God is perfect and his standards are not wrong. Or maybe you might think instead, well, as long as I'm a good person, isn't that good enough? I don't have to follow the Bible as long as I'm good enough on my own. And if you think like that, you probably have a set of standards that you try to meet. But the problem is, even by a standard that you set for yourself, you will still fail to meet it and fail to keep your own standard perfectly. So someone I know who's not a Christian, I challenge them often on, you know, why do you think that you have a good heart? And they'll often say, well, at least I didn't do that particular thing that I said I wouldn't do, and at least I'm not as bad as these other people. And I reply every time, that thing that you said you wouldn't do, I was in the car with you, and I saw you do it. I saw what you said, I saw you do what you said you wouldn't do. So we fail to meet our own standards. So what do we do instead? Instead of trusting in the law or in works, Paul says to trust in the cross of Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So if you have the footnotes there, you'll notice that the reference for cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree is from Deuteronomy. And this was before crucifixion was as common as it was in the Roman Empire. It was, it referred generally to simply just dead people being hung on a tree as a warning and as an example uh, to others who might think of breaking the law. So their dead body on display was, it was basically saying, if you break the law, then this will happen to you. You will be dead just like them. And disobedience to the law, it results in a curse. The curse is a consequence of sin, which is death. And physical death, it ultimately points to spiritual death. Ultimately, death and separation, that's what is waiting for lawbreakers. But here, we read something amazing. We read that Jesus took that curse. He took the punishment that you deserved. You see that Jesus died in your place, where you should have died. The curse of not keeping the law, even though you trusted in the law, Jesus took the punishment for you. So, that, so the result of that is so that the blessing of Abraham might come to you. And you'll notice that it's also worded a little bit differently here, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So this is a reference to Isaiah 44.3, which says, For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So there you almost see like a little parallel. The land needs water, and here Abraham's offspring, people in general, they need the Spirit. And this promise in Isaiah, it builds upon the earlier promise made to Abraham. The blessing on the offspring and nations is that they will have the Holy Spirit. God will dwell in them. And perhaps you're wondering, well, why couldn't God just bless and give his Spirit without Jesus dying? 
And ultimately, it goes back to the problem of sin. Sin made a separation between God and mankind from the very beginning with Adam and Eve. And as you read the Bible, you see that God begins to dwell with his people in a greater and greater magnitude. He dwells with more people, and more of his presence is given. So at first, it starts with one man, moves to a family, then to a nation, and ultimately in the New Testament to the whole church, to all the nations. And the final picture in Revelation, that's a picture of all of God's people will one day dwell in his presence and in his city. But sin had to be dealt with first. So that's why Jesus was crucified. Someone had to pay the price of sin. And only by trusting in, in, in the cross of Jesus Christ is the curse of the law removed. Nothing else can remove the curse of the law. So the spirit is received by faith and not by works of the law. Abraham's example of faith confirms this since he believed God when God made the promise to him. And now I'll conclude with a bit of how to live by faith and some of its practical implications for your everyday walk with God. So living by faith, it remembers that salvation is all grace. You will remember from Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Grace is something undeserved, usually, usually something good that you, did, that you didn't deserve. And grace is very unnatural to our human nature. We, we often need to relearn the gospel and grace to remind ourselves of these truths, that we are dependent on God's grace, that God is a God full of grace, that God gives grace upon grace, and that when we pray, we come before the throne of grace to receive grace in our time of need. And I think it's very true in the way that we live our lives. We don't truly know grace. So think of times when you receive something as a gift. Don't you feel like you have to give something back of equal or if not more value? Or if someone treats you to a meal, don't you feel obligated to treat them next time? Or maybe you don't even want to be treated to a meal and you have to fight for the bill before it gets to that point. You don't want to owe anyone a debt. You feel like you have to repay kindness. But living by faith, you recognize that grace, and here specifically salvation, it's a free gift of God. It's a free gift that you cannot repay. No amount of good works or good deeds that you could ever do could ever repay God for his goodness towards you and for salvation. Yet, it's so easy to start trusting in things other than the cross. So for example, Consider how much you serve, your Bible reading, how much you pray, or if you even do these things. Think also of the things that make you feel like you're more right with God, like obeying certain commands. Isn't it easy to start believing that God loves you more or less based on how much or how well you serve, how often you read your Bible, if you've read your Bible, how much you pray, if you've prayed that day? or how obedient you are generally to him. If you don't read your Bible, or you don't pray, doesn't it feel like God is less pleased with you? That he loves you less on those days than the days where you do read your Bible and pray, and the days where you serve really well? Those things, those, those are good things, so keep doing them. But you don't put any trust in them. You don't trust your works. Your works, they ultimately don't impress God and they do not change his love towards you. You honor God through your obedience to him, to what he commands, but you are not justified by what you do. You are justified by the object of your faith, by faith in Jesus Christ, and by faith alone. Think also of the sins where you break God's law. When you fall into sin, what is your response? Is it to wait better, or wait until you're better? before coming to God for forgiveness? Do you have ways to atone for your sin so that you can stand before God? But this is trusting, again, in the flesh and in your own works. Quoting from the hymn, Come ye sinners, if you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. If you wait or if you delay until you're better, you will never go to God at all. And I hope Paul's words are ringing through your mind 
having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? No, you must cling to the cross. You must run to the cross when you sin. And here I quote a New Testament scholar, we cannot do anything to merit or earn God's favor. Our works always fall short. And hence we trust what God has done for us in Christ for our salvation. Our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone. Faith is a needy cry for God, while works try to impress God. Faith is a hand reaching for help, while works insist that no help is needed. Faith trusts that God alone can accomplish salvation, while works smuggle in human effort and cooperation. So when you fall into sin, you cry out again with faith, confessing to God that you have sinned against love, you've sinned against a faithful friend, and you ask that God would forgive you because Jesus has already paid it all at the cross. God does not want you to live in a feeling of constant failure and condemnation. God does not want you to be depressed or discouraged in faith. And here I quote uh, Thomas Schreiner again. Depression and, and discouragement surely have many causes, but one of the main roots of depression is a feeling that we have failed and are unloved. The gospel summons us to reject such feelings and to place our trust in what God says about us. God declares, you are justified, liberated, and forgiven. I love you. It's unconditional love. You recognize that there is a battle with sin while you live here in the flesh, but you also recognize that the penalty of sin has been paid for in full already. From 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In the cross, there is freedom from slavery to sin and there's freedom from the guilt of sin, from the guilt and shame of sin. In the cross, there is amazing love. And here I'll quote one more time, just a, one, one great hymn. I stand amazed in the presence. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful that my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful that my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. How marvelous and how wonderful indeed. God's love for you is not based on anything that you do. God's love, it doesn't waver, it doesn't change. So trust God because of what he has done for you. What can separate you from God's great love? Nothing, nothing can separate you from God's great love. So if you're discouraged or you're depressed today, have hope again in God. You received the spirit by faith and you continue as a Christian by faith, not by works. Abraham is an example of faith who believed God at his promises. So you too, you also believe God at his promises and at the good news. Jesus took the curse of the law so that you can come to God freely with every sin paid for in full. In Galatians 2.20, we didn't, I, I didn't reference it, but Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And a life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So live by faith and not by works. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, what a wonderful love it is knowing that you are the one who has accomplished it all on the cross. You're the one who has fulfilled your promises to us that the, the debt that we could not pay, our sin, our punishment, Jesus bore it all so that we could be reconciled to you. God, we thank you for this great love Thank you that salvation is not dependent upon our works and that we, we do not have to rely on our works, but it is simply by faith. Salvation is all grace towards us. You are 
You show us abundant grace. You give us good things that we do not deserve. And Lord, we remember your goodness and your kindness to us. So help us as we, as we look forward to the, to the rest of our lives, to the rest of our day. Lord, help us to live by grace and by faith, knowing that you have made an end to, to sin and that we can come to you, knowing that our identity is secure in Christ. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness to us. We ask and pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Please rise for...